Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so my main research somewhat is enzodynamics. And I have this logo, you might have seen it before, which I try to emphasize the atmospheric side of Enzo. So I s s rearrange the logo to call it Enzo Air. So it's kind of my theme is looking at enzodynamics. <clears throat> but since this is an extreme um, workshop, and I don't know anything much about extremes, but I, I try to get the connection a little bit. So I will focus on the enzodynamics. And maybe this gives you a basis of how this might connect to extremes. But I will not talk about extremes as such. So I will only talk about ENSO and, and its characteristics. And I have basically four main things that I talk about. So I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to ENSO. And then I have four things that I talk about that I think are relevant if you think about ENSO current research and related to extremes. I think to me extremes is always related to nonlinearities. So it's the extreme side of the distribution, and often this is dominated by nonlinearities. Then, of course, extremes that we are interested in are not in the tropical Pacific, but where we live. So teleconnections are important. That's the second point. And then maybe we use models a lot to understand things, how, how they um, work. And we might want to have a look at how good the models actually are. So this is a positive way of formulating the questions. But the outcome you will see might be a bit different. And then at the end, climate change is, of course, important. And that is where I talk about this a little bit. So there's four main things that I will talk about. And feel free to ask questions in between or at the end. Okay. Because there's a lot of things that I will not cover, but maybe you have asked questions about that. And maybe ask these questions then at the end if I have not covered something that you are interested in. OK, so introduction. So I show you here sea surface temperature anomalies in maximum here 4 degrees plus and 4 degree minus. And this is unfiltered. It's a single month, December of four different years. And I picked four strong and new events. You might recognize some maybe. So this is 1997. This is 2016. Um, and you can see, I think what is outstanding is if without any filtering, this, this is big, right? There's nothing else as big. And if you pick any months ever to do the same plot, you will see nothing as big as this in global temperatures. So this is clearly by far the most dominant thing that happens in the Pacific or in, in the global oceans. And it is a very clear structure. So it, it's fairly outstanding. So this is why El Nino is probably the, the lighthouse of climate variability because it's the most clearly recognizable signal that, that we see. Um, and the structure somewhat you see it's it's uh, East Pacific, Central Pacific, so here's a date line. Um, and it's a very strong warming along this east equatorial Pacific. And it touches here more or less the coastline and then goes up along the coastline up to California sometimes. Not always, but you see in 1997 there was also the strong warming along California. So that's a very nice signal. So these are the four strongest El Nino events. And now I show you the four strongest, four strong El Nino events, so the opposite. And you can see it is somewhat similar with opposite sign, but not exactly similar. Right? So if I flip between these two, you can see that they are slightly different. Right? Not sure how you would describe it, but I think two things that I recognize, if you look at the lower right corner here, just this one, um, the La Nina is more to the left, so it moves away from the South American coastline and, and more into the center. And it's wider, right? it's more off the equator. So especially the one here up in the upper left corner, it's pretty widespread. This one is also more widespread. And they are more in the center Pacific. Um, I'm showing this because there's been a discussion about Central Pacific and East Pacific El Ninos. And some people call the Central Pacific El Nino El Nino Modoki. And about 10 years ago, I did a lecture of El Nino, and I made these plots. And I said, wait a second. This Central Pacific is El Nino, and East Pacific is El Nino. And, and around the same time, a number of people said that, that the Central Pacific and East Pacific is not so much difference in El Nino, but it's a difference between El Nino and La Nina. I, I come back to this a little bit. But you can see they are more or less the opposite, but they are somewhat different. <clears throat> OK, so we have El Nino being this big amount of warming along the equatorial Pacific. Here's a time series. And I've put out a few years, which are fairly significant El Nino years. So the four big ones here, the 19, 2016, 1997, and then 83, and then 73. 
So some people say it's oscillating, and some people say it's maybe not so oscillating. You see there's sometimes big ones, and it's not exactly oscillating. It's fairly chaotic, but there's somewhat these two to seven years oscillations, even though they are not that clear. So it's a bit noisy. OK, about the dynamics, how does El Nino really work? There's this nice video that I'd like to show you that illustrates this a little bit. OK, so you see here the colors are temperatures, and then this um, shiny thing is a bit the sea surface. And you see this is along the equator, there's a little bit of dynamics. You see some waves going on there. This is now spread out. <coughs> so you see this coton along the equator. So along the equator, there's this, this variability, which is a little bit colder, and it spreads around these little waves here. And you see, really, what's going on in the subsurface is somewhat more important. So we are here in 1997, and you see something in the subsurface, there's something moving across. And you can see this better if you look at anomalies. So I, I skip forward a little bit and go to anomalies. So this shows you now the same thing again, but now in anomalies. <laughs> and, and, and watch here the time. So this is 1997. Six, and at the end of 1997, there's a new event. And you see before that, there's warm water piling up in the subsurface that then spreads out to the east. So you see it's piling up, then it goes to the east here, here, and now it gets warm here. So the idea of El Nino is that there's something happening in the subsurface of the ocean. And while this is warm, there's something negative already developing in the subsurface that also spreads out then to the east and reverses the sign here. You see this? That's a very nice animation showing what's happening in the ocean. Um, since I'm mostly looking at the atmosphere, but I still think this is a key thing about Enzo, that what happens in the subsurface. So he's, here's again showing this in a diagram. So you see here the surface and the subsurface, about the upper 500 meters, so somewhere around 200 meters. So before the 1997 event gets warm, there's this warm anomaly in the subsurface. This warm anomaly in the subsurface is much bigger what we see later on in the, in the surface. So these in the subsurface here, these are 12 degrees and more. And at the surface, at the end, it's 4 degrees. So you see the subsurface thing that happens here, it propagates to the east. That leads to a lot of warming. And why this warming happens, and there's already a cooling developing here. So that gets you an idea that this, the whole thing is some kind of oscillation going on. So something happens at the surface, and the subsurface it propagates. Then it comes to the surface, and then it goes into the subsurface. So the essential idea is a so-called recharge oscillator model. And I'll explain this now in, in a little sketch. So this idea of Enzo, how it works, follows the idea of en uh, heat being recharged and discharged. So here, this is a surface layer, so the surface of the Pacific, currently in neutral. There's no temperature anomalies. So this is before El Nino. And here, this is the subsurface of the whole Pacific. And this dashed line here shows you the neutral depths of the warm layer of the surface. We call this a thermocline depth. And if it's deeper, let's say here currently it's deeper than normal, then it means there's more warm water underneath the surface of the tropical Pacific. So before an Nino, there's somewhat a deeper thermocline depth, so more warm water. So that this H here is, is below normal means there's more warm water. So we have a warm anomaly in the subsurface. Then that leads to warming at the surface at the end at the east. So this propagates to the east a little bit, and then it leads to warming in the east. The warming in the east leads to weakening of the winds. And maybe you know that the winds in the Pacific are easterly winds, so they push the warm water constantly to the west. And as these winds weaken, then this warm water from the west pushes back, so flips back to the, to the west. So you see this weakening of the winds due to the warming here and reduces the thermocline depths in the west. And therefore, you have a cool anomaly developing here. So this cool anomaly that develops while it's warm here is because of these winds. These winds are weakening. That means much of the warm water, which usually gets pushed to the west, now it doesn't get pushed to the west anymore. And therefore, this cold anomaly is developing. And this cold anomaly that develops then um, spreads out more and more to the east. So that in the transition to La Nina, we have then again neutral conditions at the surface, and we have this cold anomaly, which is due to this weakening of the winds, spread out all the way to the east. And that then, then leads to cooling. The cooling at the surface then leads to an intensification of the winds. So the winds now are more easterly and push much more warm water to the west. So then the warm water piles up again here. And then we close the cycle. So we are back to this condition. 
So this is this idea of how Enzo works. It's a cycle or recharge discharge cycle of heat in the subsurface. And this heat on the subsurface is kind of created by these winds in the surface, which are a function of the temperature. So it's this interaction of what the temperature does, the winds, and then the thermocline depths. This is probably the most fundamental view of, of how, how Enzo works, this interaction between surface temperature, winds, and the subsurface um, thermocline depths. So this can be formulated in terms of an equation. Um, maybe many of you don't like equations that much, but I, I like it. So, um, so you have a tendency equation for the temperature. So how does the temperature evolve over time? And here's a ten tendency equation for the thermocline depths. And you see there are some parameters, and they are connected. So the temperature, let me go here first. First of all, we have, for the temperature tendency, we have this proportion to the temperature itself. So this is in terms of anomalies. So if temperature is positive, that means if A11 would be positive, this would be growing. This is why this thing is a growth rate. So this A11 is called growth rate. But if A11 is negative, then it's doing the opposite of growing. It's damping. So a negative growth rate would be called damping. And, and actually, this value is an average negative. So this is actually a damping term. Same for the thermocline depths. We have a damping or growth rate term, which is more or less zero. So it's almost undamped. So this is kind of an oscillator equation. So you have a damping term or growth rate term, and then you have an oscillating term, which is a coupling term here. So this term here is leading to the connection between thermocline depths and temperature, and temperature and thermocline depths. And so this second term means that the temperature is sensitive to what the thermocline depth is. And if you have a positive thermocline depth, this will lead to warming. And in other terms, if you have a temp uh, uh, Positive temperature anomaly, this value here actually is negative. Maybe I can show you the values. I'll show you the values later on. And this leads to a reduction in the thermocline depths. So there's a connection between these two um, equations. That means we have a coupled system, and this is this recharge discharge oscillation. And then we have noise driving the system. So since the system is damped by itself, it would not oscillate. So there's noise driving the system. So in a sketch, the temperature is here, this temperature in the East Pacific. And the sur surface is the thermocline depth of the whole Pacific. And heat flux forcing and, and winds are not showing in this equation. But in principle, this, this heat fl uh, this winds go into this equation here and a little bit into this one here. But they are not shown in the equation. They are basically put into these parameters. OK, and then in terms of absolute values, as I said, this damping term here of the growth rate is negative, so it's damped. The growth rate of the thermocline depth is fairly close to zero, but weakly damped. And then this coupling term here, this one is positive, and this one is negative. That means if you have a deeper thermocline depth than normal, it leads to warming. And if you have a warm temperature, this leads to a reduction of the thermocline depth. This is what just what I showed in these little sketches before. This is exactly describing what we saw in this sketch here. So deeper than normal, so larger than normal age leads to warming. And then warming leads to lower than normal age. So this is basically what the equations just say. They exactly describe the situation. OK, just to show you how this looks like. So this is just forcing these equations with random. Um, well, in simulations, you can just force this with random noise, and you get, get a time series. But this is here from observations. So red is temperature from 1990 to 2000. And you see these big events. And then you see the thermocline depths before these events, they always peak, right? So here, the peak before this event, and they peak before that. That means that the buildup of the thermocline depths, so the warm water and subsurface, that leads them to rising of the temperature. OK, so this is a dynamical picture of how Enzo works in principle. And you can think about this as randomly fluctuating. And it's a, if you look at these equations, these are linear equations, right? So these, there's no nonlinear terms in it. It's all simplified and linear. So this is a basic picture. OK, so so much about the basic of ENSO. Now let's get to the more interesting parts, the nonlinearity. So if it's a linear model like the one I just described, it would have a normal distribution like this one. So this is a normal distribution. And then the extremes on the right, right hand side and the extremes on the left hand side. This is a sketch from David Caroli on, on Monday, I think. And if there's a mean sh shift, change or change in, in spread and variance, you would have a change in the extremes. But um, so this normal distribution here would describe a 
would follow from these equations that I just showed you. If things are uh, linear, you would probably get a normal distribution. But ENSO is not linear. ENSO is actually nonlinear, and you probably know this. So if you look at here, the distribution of temperature values of the Nino 3 region, which is this equatorial Pacific region of, of temperatures, it has these extreme values on the right-hand side, which we call El Nino, but it doesn't have extreme values on the left-hand side, the La Niñas. And it, you can quantify this in terms of these parameters of this distribution. So I, I talk here about anomalies, so the mean is zero, standard deviation is about one, and this gamma one is the skewness, so the asymmetry, and it's more almost one. That means the positive extremes are much more likely than the negative extremes. And this has been known for a long time. So this is basically what I think most people know about El Niño is that these El Niño events are stronger than El Niño events. But in the last 10 years, there has been a, quite a bit of research on this. And there's actually much more to the nonlinearity of ENSO than, than just this thing. And this is what I'd like to show you now. That ENSO is not just nonlinear. That means that it's stronger on this side and, and weaker on this side. There's, there's much more to it that is actually interesting. And I think it's also fairly important if you think about extremes over Australia or so. So my initial introduction plot, I would like to quantify this now. How does an Niño pattern look like? So I picked here strong Niños, so more than 1.5 standard deviation, and I made a composite of that. And I normalize this composite by the average Niño 3.4 SST. So I divide by the average in this central box here. I'll show you a central box in a second. Now I do the same thing for La Niña. And again, I, I normalize it, so they are both positive because they are divided by the average of the central box, of this box. So you only look at the shape of the, dis of the pattern and the amplitude. And you can see these two patterns are slightly different. Right? So this one is clearly focused on the equator and goes all the way to South America. This one here peaks in the center and is more widespread. Now it's, I do the same thing for weak El Niños. So now I pick El Niños which are not strong but actually weak. And you can notice now this pattern looks much more like this one and not like this one. And I do the same thing for weak La Niñas. This weak La Niñas move more like the strong La Niños. So there's a strange kind of change in shape of pattern depending on whether you have strong or weak or positive or negative. So here I show the difference between these two plot, plots. This here is the difference between these two plots. And these two are the differences between these two. And you see all of them show this kind of strange dipole, which happens to be very similar to EF number two, which many people call an modoki. I find it very misleading because an EUF doesn't have such a simple interpretation. But it's interesting to see that these nonlinearities between um, sign or strengths always project onto this dipole pattern. That means that there's a nonlinearity in the shape of an in, in the pattern of an inyo. And this has basically been published by Ken Takahashi and myself. So here I show you the strengths of this P PC1, of the, the, the dominant pattern, the EUF number one pattern, and the strengths of the PC2. And if you look at this point distribution, if EUF modes would be independent, you would expect them to be a, just a random noise. But if you average them on the x-axis, you see there's a kind of nonlinear relationship between these two. And that basically looks like this. So that's a fit that, that I did, but Ken Takahashi did exactly the same thing, more or less. And that means an Niño, a strong Niño has this equatorial confined to the east pattern. A strong Niño is more this wide um, Central Pacific-like pattern. And then the weak ones are exactly flipped. So these patterns of Niño, they change with the strength and sign. It's not always the same pattern. So some people say there's East Pacific and Central Pacific. And some people say there's Niño Modoki and maybe the canonical Niño. And Ken Takahashi and myself, you would probably say there's an La Niña pattern and there's an Niño pattern. Right. So the La Niña pattern is this, what people call Niño Modoki or Central Pacific pattern. And if you look at this pattern, so I show you here with a negative sign. This is the distribution. This pattern has also a strong skewness. It has strong negative extremes. So negative extreme times negative times negative gets you negative extremes. There are negative extreme La Niñas, which you don't see if you do an EUF analysis or something like that, that you don't see that this La Niña pattern actually has extremes as well. And the El Niño pattern, which is this East Pacific confined pattern, 
has very strong extreme values here on the right-hand side. So they have positive extremes. So really this idea of N Nino being nonlinear, having extremes on one-hand side, it has extremes on both sides. It's N Ninos are extreme in this pattern, and La Ninas are extreme on the negative side of patterns. Okay, then the second thing that has been pointed out, it's not just the pattern that is having differences, it's nonlinear, but it's also the time evolution. So here again I show you it composites of strong Aninos and strong Laninas, and again they are normalized with Nino 3, so you just compare the relative patterns to each other. And zero is the time when they peak. So this is the peak of Nino and this is the peak of Laninia, both having the same signs because I have normalized them. And you can see for an Nino before there's a negative anomaly and afterwards there's a negative anomaly. But for Laninia there's no negative anomaly following. That means after Laninia comes another Laninia while after an Nino there comes a Laninia. So there's an asymmetry in the time evolution. And if you look at this asymmetry, it, it looks, so the difference between these two plots looks like this. So there's kind of a propagation that you can see here. So you can check this. So this is from observations. And you can test this, whether this is also happening in models. So we have this asymmetry in the patterns, which is best described by this equatorial shift. And we have the asymmetry in the time evolution which shows you this after the event and before the event that there's an asymmetry. So we estimated this and calculated this for each for, for a number of CMIP models. And observations are these blue points here. So you see most of the models tend to be in this upper right quarter, having this nonlinearity in the pattern and in the time evolution. But a lot of them spread around zero, right? So they don't really have this nonlinearity. But there's this tendency that the models do this as well but not as strong as it is observed. And the question is, where does this come from, this nonlinearity? And there's a lot of discussion about where does any new nonlinearities come from. From my point of view, because I have published this myself, but as I say, there's two. I think it comes from the wind as a T relationship. This is probably not the only thing, but it's, I think it's the most dominant thing, and it's the most clearest um, studies that show nonlinearities coming from something, it is the wind SST relationship, I think. And this has been shown by several people. This is the relationship here between the strength of the temperature anomaly, so Nino 3 SST anomaly, and the strength of the sonal wind stress, so the east-west winds, how strong they, do they re respond. And you can see if you make a fit, this is somewhat a nonlinear fit. That means when the temperatures are warmer, there's more of a response than when the temperatures are cooler. And I think I don't exactly know where it comes from, but it's probably related to the idea that moist convection will be more intensive responding if it's warmer. So maybe this wind response is related to moist convection and that is more intensive due to the clausius one relationship that when you have warmer temperature anomalies. But this relationship has been found by a number of studies and has been shown by a number of studies working in models as well. You have this nonlinear relationship. And if you have this nonlinear relationship, we can go back to the research oscillator equation and see what would this do if you force your research oscillator equation with this nonlinear wind relationship. And this I can show you here in this diagram. So this shows you again time here, lag lead. So this is zero is the peak of the event before the event on the left and after the event on the right. And the dashed line here in the middle is first of all a linear model. So the research oscillator model uh, in a linear way, linear relationship between um, SST and wind. And on the y-axis, this is thermal kind depth. So I said that before an event, there's a deeper thermal kind depth anomaly. So we, before the event, we have a peak in the thermal kind depth, and then afterwards, it's negative. So this is a linear relationship. If you consider this nonlinear wind relationship, then you would get slightly different relationships for La Nina and El Nino. So for El Nino, you will have also a peak before, but weaker than no, in a linear relationship. But it would always already turn sign before the peak of the event and gets into very strong negative after the event. This strong negative anomaly then causes the Laninia to develop. So because you have this strong semiconductor depth developing due to the nonlinear wind, you get the Laninia after an Nino. For a Laninia event, you have also an anomaly before the peak, uh, event, but this is much, is much stronger. And then after the event, there's not much of an anomaly. This is why after Laninia, you don't have a change in sign, because this anomaly is too weak. So I think much of the nonlinearities of an Nino comes from this nonlinear wind SST relationship. 
and that explains the nonlinear relationship between thermocline depths and, and SST as well. If you look at this, you might think this gives you a predict, predict, prediction scale. So you know that after an Nino, there should be La Nina. And before La Nina, there should have been a strong anomaly in thermocline depths. And if there's a strong anomaly in thermocline depths, you would think it should be more predictable. So we tested this in a model. So we made 100 perfect model forecast predictions. So we took our own model, restarted it again with slightly changed boundary conditions, and then see what happens. And the black is the forecast skill of all events in terms of anomalies. So this is zero lag, 12 months lead time, and this is anomaly correlation. So high skill here and zero skill here. So the skill is decreasing. And an average for all events, it is somewhat here 0.5 after 12 months. But the Lanilla events on the longer time, so on, on a lead prediction of 9 to 12 months, is much more predictable than an Inyo, at least in our model. And I'm pretty sure that this is true in observations, although not everybody agrees on this. But in observations, it's difficult to test because you don't have that many events to do it. This is based on 100 events, more or less. Right? So it's difficult to test this in observations. OK, summary. Um, Enzo is strongly nonlinear, and it's not just um, stronger in Inyos and bigger Laninias. Actually, it's more complicated than that. So the pattern is changing. It's nonlinear. Um, there's a nonlinear time evolution. And it is most likely one of the main contributing factors to this is the nonlinear wind response to SST. That leads to the nonlinear behavior of the semicline depths, and that leads to the different time evolution and also to the shape, change in pattern. And it also leads to nonlinearity and the predictability. That means La Nina's will be more predictable than any yours. OK. So we have seen that Enino as itself, by its own dynamics, has strong nonlinearities. But maybe you are more interested in the teleconnections, so what happens then later on somewhere else in the regions where we actually live. So we know now we have these different patterns. So this Enino pattern and the La Nina pattern. And we now want to see how does the atmosphere respond to these patterns. So we made a number of experiments with an access model and forcing these idealized patterns. So either a strong El Nino pattern or actually a negative El Nino pattern, and then the same as the La Nina patterns. And we looked at how does the atmosphere respond to that. And our assumption was that this would lead to different responses. So we did quite a few experiments. So what I show you here is now the sea level pressure response, the global map, to these idealized patterns. And there's quite some information here. So um, first of all, they are all normalized to the strength of the Nino 3 SST. That means that everything is responding in the same way, with a sa in, in a linear way. All the, all the maps here should look the same, both in shape and in, in amplitude. And on the left-hand side, I show you the this, this central Pacific, or this and La Nina-like pattern. And on the right-hand side, is the El Nino-like pattern that we take a forcing. And we go from minus 200%, so strong negative, to weakly negative, to strong positive. So this, this is a very strong positive um, temperature anomaly, and here's a very strong negative temperature anomaly. And then the left one is for the Central Pacific, and the east one, uh, the right one is for the East Pacific pattern. And the question is, are all these patterns the same, both in amplitude and shape, or are they different? And I think if you look at this, um, might be easy, not so easy to see because these patterns are so small. So I, I flip it so that I can get these patterns bigger. Because um, now you have to tilt your head, but now the patterns are bigger. I think you can see that the East Pacific, this amplitude here, is smaller than this one. But I have it normalized for Nino 3 for the strengths of the forcing that I put in. In other words, if it's linear, they should be the same. But it's not linear. Right? So you can see there's an intensification of the response. So the more positive my pattern gets, the so stronger the kick of the atmosphere is. So there's a nonlinearity. It, 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 the atmosphere response is more and more the warmer the SSTs are. I think you can somewhat also see it for the Central Pacific event. So this orange line here is the date line in both of them. And then you can also see that the patterns have slightly changed from here to here. So you see, for example, in the East Pacific, you have this clear um, low pressure near South America. And then this low pressure shifted more into the Central Pacific. And then in, this east, in the center Pacific, you see the strong anomalies around Australia that are typically not as strong in, in the East Pacific and pattern. So I tilt your head back. So I think there's a change. There's an intensification with strengths. 
So there's a nonlinearity in the response. And there's also a difference between the C East P in these two different patterns. They shift the teleconnections. So we summarize this here somewhat for, for different boxes. So let's look at the sea level pressure response in this box. And I have my East Pacific pattern and my Central Pacific pattern. I made six different experiments. So each point is, is an experiment, same here. And I looked how strong the sea level pressure responded. And you can see the response here is fairly linear. And the response here is also fairly linear. But the gradient is not the same. If you look at this, this gradient is stronger than this one. In the real world, I showed you that there's a combination of these patterns, East Pacific and Central Pacific, depending on whether you have La Nina or El Nino. So you have to make a combination of these two so that you, on the negative strong side, you have to take the CP pattern. On the positive strong side, you have to take the EP pattern. And then you get a slight uh, nonlinearity in here. So that's not so dramatic. More interesting is what happens in the North Pacific. So if you look at the North Pacific box, you have a strongly nonlinear response to the East Pacific pattern. That's a strong nonlinear response to this East Pacific pattern. You also have a strong nonlinear response to the Central Pacific pattern. If you combine these two the way that you actually observe them, it is almost linear. But it's two nonlinearities compensating. So we have here two linear things getting nonlinear, two nonlinear things getting linear, and the last one that we need is um, two linear things getting strongly nonlinear, which is in the Southern Pacific. So you have more or less two linear responses, but the response here to the Central Pacific pattern is much stronger than to the East Pacific pattern. It gets you this nonlinear behavior. So there's a combination of, of things that actually makes it fairly complicated. So the teleconnections of ENSO are complicated by the fact that the SST pattern already is nonlinear, but the atmospheric response to these patterns are nonlinear too. So you have two combinations of nonlinearities that um, lead to nonlinearities. So what I show you here is the t test values for linearity. So if everything is linear, the t value should be low, so less than 2. And significant would be something like 2 point something. And then 4, 5, 6, 10 are highly significant t values. And you can see most of the tropics are colored. And there's these transitions between different curves. So you either have a curve like this, or you have a curve like this. Right? And these are the different zones that you see here. But basically, all of the tropics are responding nonlinear to, en to ENSO in the teleconnections. OK, so summary of the nonlinearities and teleconnections. So ENSO teleconnections are strongly nonlinear. And it's a combination of two things. It's a linear response to a nonlinear SST pattern. So the SST pattern itself is nonlinear, being different for different strengths and different signs. And then there's a nonlinear response to a linear pattern. Even if you prescribe always the same pattern, the atmosphere response is nonlinear in different locations. OK, how good are models? I already showed you a little bit about models. And I, they indicated that they are doing something right, but not perfectly as observed. So I look at this now a little bit more in detail. And I use these recharge oscillator equations. So there's a number of parameters in this recharge oscillator equation. Basically, these four, so the, 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 cup, uh, the, the growth rate and the coupling, and then the strength of the noise. But if you want to look at this carefully, this, 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 temp, this growth rate of temperature is a very important parameter. And you better split this up into the wind, which you call the Bjorkness feedback. This is often called the Bjorkness feedback. So how strong does the wind respond to SST? And then the heat flux stamping, which is often a cloud feedback. So I split this up into three parts, basically. Uh, Bjorkness feedback, so the wind response, heat flux feedback, which is mostly a cloud feedback, and then the residual, which we call the ocean feedback. So we now have actually. These five and these three, we have eight parameters that we can um, analyze on observations, and we can compare it how they look like in the models. So this is what I did here. So you see some distributions. So the upper one, first of all, is just a standard deviation of temperature. And the black line is observed, and the gray shaded area around is the uncertainty from observations. And then the blue distribution is the one from the models, the CMIP models, with a blue line, which is almost perfectly on the black line. So just from the SST standard deviation, you would think the models are perfect. They have exactly the same standard deviation as observed. Now, if you look at the patterns, so these, uh, at the parameters, so these are the eight parameters. And I ordered them by how important they are for the tendency equations. So how much do they change the behavior? So the most important one is the, what does it say? The Bjorkness feedback, so the wind response to SST. And the least important one here is the coupling of the temperature to the thermal depths. That is not so important in terms of uncertainty. 
And you can see here the, the wind, so this is all normalized, so that means the observed value is always at 1, and then here's 0. And you can see the <coughs> models spread, all of them are too low, and the average is about half as strong as observed. So the most important parameter is strongly underestimated. The second most important parameter is the atmospheric damping, so the cloud feedback. In most models, and this is a negative feedback, so it should be strongly damping, but in most models this is not damping enough. So most models have two weak cloud feedbacks, two positive, basically. Um, just the atmospheric, oh, sorry, no, this, this was the ocean damping, and this one is the atmospheric feedback. So this is the atmospheric response is too weak in models. And the only thing which is overestimated is the damping of the thermocline depths, which is strongly overestimated. But you can see you have the four most important parameters all being biased in the models, but eventually they all come out with the right standard deviation which means that they are compensating errors. Or you could be negative, you might be saying the models are tuned. Um, another aspect which is important, you might have heard about that El Niño influences the rest of the world, but actually the rest of the world feeds back onto El Niño. In particular, the tropical Indian Ocean and the tropical Atlantic Ocean influence El Niño. So this is also something that in the last 10 years, a number of studies have shown that. In particular, the Atlantic is interesting because the Atlantic is more independent of ENSO and it can trigger El Niño events. So it is interesting to look at how the relationship between Atlantic, tropical Atlantic and ENSO looks like. And one graph that a number of people have shown is this lake lead relationship. So here is the peak of an El Niño event, before the El Niño event, and after the El Niño event. And red is the observed relationship between Atlantic and, and El Niño. So if it's before and it peaks here negative, that means a positive anomaly in the Atlantic leads to a negative anomaly in the in, in Pacific, or a negative anomaly in the Atlantic leads to a positive anomaly in the Pacific. And you can see the strongest relationship that you see is when the Atlantic leads El Niño. When El Niño leads Atlantic, this relationship is not as strong. So there's this asymmetric relationship that the Atlantic forces El Niño more than El Niño forces the Atlantic. It's a bit surprising, but I think in the last 10 years, there's a number of studies that confirmed this in different ways. And here, all the blue lines are the models, and the black line is the average model. And you can see the average model is not doing that. Right? In the average model, the Atlantic has, no, has very little or no influence on the Pacific, because this is more or less zero here, while the Pacific does influence the Atlantic. So all of these models are biased towards that this interaction between the basins, the Atlantic influencing the Pacific, is not correct in the models. Another thing that you can look at is at the pattern of variability. So this is the typic, this is the you have one mode of observed SST variability, and that's this nice and new pattern that you probably all know of, know of. And I, I look at these, I make these pattern analysis, so EF analysis for all of the CMIP models, so CMIP three and CMIP five and for a simple slab ocean model, which should not have an annual. It's basically saying, what would the patterns look like if there is no annual? And then the green one is observations, a different data set. So I took two different data sets, and the triangle here gives you the uncertainty. So um, on the x-axis here, I have the uncertainty or the error on the shorter time scale, so time scale is less than five years. And on the y-axis is the uncertainty in this pattern on the longer time scale, so longer than five years. And the dash green line gives you what I assume is statistical uncertainty. So if the models all would agree with observations, I expect them to be in this box. And you can see from the scale that I put up here that they are not in the box. So this is a CMIP3 data. And you can see some models are actually far away from the truth, right? By 100% in eigenvalue. It means the amount of variance explained by a certain pattern is 100% wrong. It's more than twice as much or half as much or something like that. But some models are pretty good. So the best models are actually pretty good, good, close to observations. But then the not so good models are really far outside. Um, so you would like, think that CMIP5 should improve on this, and it does. It makes an improvement. But the improvement is mostly by losing the very bad models, the ones that have patterns that look nothing like the real world, while the good models are as good as the CMIP3. So there is an improvement, but mostly by getting rid of the very bad models. Otherwise, there's not much of an improvement. And for reference, a model that doesn't have an Niño is here. This is a model that doesn't have the pattern. If you look at it, you will never see an Niño in this model. 
and some models are worse than, than this model. So it's a mixed bag. So they, are, they have this pattern mostly. Many models are pretty good in that, but then there's a, a large set of models which are actually pretty bad in simulating this pattern. I forgot to write a summary, but it's more or less like this. So it's, you are unhappy. <laughs> I had a summary slide somewhere, but I couldn't find it, so I, I made the short version of the summary. It, we are not happy. Okay, that gets us to climate change. And I think from knowing the first point that I just said, that the models are not good, maybe you shouldn't look into cl models at all when you talk about climate change. Because how much would you believe that if they are um, so, uh, so have so many problems? Nevertheless, there's actually, if you hear about climate change in the tropical Pacific or in Indio, people make very strong statements and they say there's a clear signal based on these models. And the clear signals are stated usually the following. It's an Aninio-like mean state change. So the equatorial East Pacific will warm more than the rest. Um, this leads to weakening and eastward shift of the Walker circulation. And there's no strong changes in SST viability. So the strength of Aninio viability is about the same in the models. That is more or less a summary of what the models project. But I don't believe this, I must say. There's, I'm not convinced. And there's basically three reasons why I would not sign this and I would not say that you should be, remember this because I don't think that this is likely to happen. I haven't shown you this yet, but I'll show you some observations now and they make you very be strongly believe that there's something going wrong with the models. I already showed you that there are strong biases in the models and there's no reason to believe that we make the correct predictions if we have so strong biases in the dynamics. I mean, they compensate to create something that looks very close to observations in some as aspects. But if you have a wind, um, a Bjorkness feedback, which is only half as strong as observed, or you have cloud feedbacks, which are the wrong sign in many models, how would you believe what they do in the future? So there are these strong biases. And then there's also a lack of understanding. I, I come back to this um, later on. So first of all, I'll show you something about the observations. So this is a trend in the tropics over the last few decades. And... This is what has been observed, and it's been more or less a cooling trend in the East Pacific. This is co related to this idea of global warming hiatus, and the rest has been warming. So there's been no warming or more or less a cooling trend in the East Pacific over the last decades. These are the predicted trends from the models in average. So driven with global warming um, scenarios, they would in average warm everywhere, and if you have good eyes, you can see it is a bit more warming here than here and here. This is a Niño like warming. And the difference between these patterns is shown here. So you might argue this can happen if there's natural variability. So maybe this is a natural fluctuation, and this can just happen. And this is just the uh, externally forced trend. So you can look at all simulations, at all decades that ever happen in any kind of simulation and make a distribution of these decadal trends. This is the observed trends. And, in not, and there's not a single simulation where ever simulated a trend like this one. Never, ever. No model has ever simulated a trend that looked like this over the last 30 years. That, to me, indicates there's something, there's a mismatch, right? If this is natural ability or climate change, it should be within this distribution here because these models have natural ability and they have climate change in it, but the observed point is not in the distribution. It gets much worse if you look at winds. So this is from Matthew England et al.'s paper. The wind distribution observ observed is these... Um, empty bars, and the most realistic one is this dashed line. This is the wind trends over the last few decades, and the colored distribution is what you can actually observe in models. And this is not just an outlier, it's just not consistent, right? I mean, this, if this is the distribution of what models are doing, it should be representing the real world, then this is not from the real world. But since this is from the real world, I would say the models are not presenting the real world. So I think there's a large mismatch in the models in the tropical Pacific, and we don't know exactly why that is, and this is why I would not trust the models in predicting the change of the tropical Pacific. <clears throat> Here's another way of illustrating a similar thing. This is from Tobias Bias, and I'm a co-author of that. So here's a change in the Walker circulation. So on the x-axis is the east-westward shift. So is it shifting to the east or to the west? And on the y-axis is the, um, the strength of the Walker circulation. So a strong walker circulation is a linear-like state, it's up here, and a weak walker circulation is down here. So I said that the models, these are all the model, each number is a model, predict a weakening and an eastward shift. You can see they fairly agree to be on the lower right corner. But observations is actually off the chart, right? The observations is up, up somewhere here. 
So this might be natural variability, and it might come back in here, but it's unlikely to come down here. Right? So it looks like the models are predicting a trend in, in the Walker circulation that certainly hasn't happened in the last 30 years, but it seems unlikely that this will happen. So there's a big puzzle right now how you can match this to the observations. Maybe this is, there's, there's two ways of, of saying that we can solve this. Either there's natural ability that we have in the models, which is a lot of people think that this is a case, and it might be related to the Atlantic-Pacific interaction. Or the other alternative is that the models are predicting the climate change wrong. And I don't know which one it is true, but a combination of this is probably correct. Okay, so the last point um, is the interaction, um, understanding how climate change works in the tropical Pacific. So since I'm not convinced by the CMIP models and the observations indicate that we don't know what's going on. I made a simple model trying to understand how Pacific climate change would work. And I used a simple slab mo ocean model that just has atmospheric heat flux and no ocean dynamics. And I coupled it with the recharge oscillator equation so that we have an Nino, but only the linear Nino, nothing nonlinear in the ocean in, the, in, in, in terms of nonlinear ocean dynamics. So we have a linear ocean and Nino, and we have a slab ocean, and we combine them together. So I make a model simulation of doubling the CO2, and I only show you the response pattern. So the response pattern here is everything is red, and orange means warming. There's more warming here and less warming here. And this is in the slab ocean simulation. So I made a 50-year simulation, average over 30 years, and this is the warming pattern that you see. And I showed you here the two boxes, so the left and the right, and I show you the West Pacific warms by 1.6, and the in your three, once by 1.5, so there's not much of a difference. So you would say it's neither, neither a linear like nor a la Niña like. It doesn't project really on a Niña or a la Niña. So the slab ocean without any ocean dynamics creates a pattern, but that pattern is more like a north south, but it's not an a Niña like pattern. Now I use the same model with my linear ocean Enzo dynamics, the recharge oscillator model, and I get this warming pattern. So now I have the recharge oscillator linear and a Niña pattern in it. And if you look at these two, they are more or less the same. There's no difference, more or less. They warm exactly the same. In other words, the linear and Nino dynamics are irrelevant for climate change. What happens in the tropical Pacific is not related to linear endodynamics. It must be other things that dominate the change, if there is a different kind of change. But you already get a lot of structure from just having the atmospheric heat fluxes being different and no ocean dynamics. So from this, in terms of future and Nino, um, the CMA projections do not agree with observations, and I think this is a serious issue. The models have common biases, and they don't agree with observations, and they have common biases. This, this I think, is a this red alert, so we should think about this more. We don't really know how it should change. I mean, we know a lot of things about climate change, and we know how it should change, but we don't really know how this should the tropical Pacific change. Should the water circulation become stronger or weaker? I don't think there's a strong theoretical framework for any direction. The ENSO research dynamics, these simple dynamics that we think of ENSO, are leading to no changes. And in turn, that means whatever changes we see in the tropical Pacific, I, I think, are not related to the ENSO dynamics that we know of, but it must be something else. And it's most likely these other dynamics are important at the end. And I think a La Nina-like walker circulation intensifying and moving westwards is still possible. I'm not saying that this is going to happen, I think, to me, this is as likely as an annual like change or no change. I just don't know it yet. That's it. Thank you. Questions? Questions? Let's go back to the um, recharge of slider side. The equations? Or? No, the, this, the, um, the picture. Um, the, the diagrams. Oh, and I was explaining one of the recharge models, so I think. Yeah, I'm looking for it, this one here. Yeah, that one. Um, so you get, you get your deep um, thermocline, and then on the big boil, and then you get the Armino. You know, that's it's causing the cooling on the west side. Yeah. Um, and, it's like, and then you got the warming on the west side and the east side. But when you go to the before and the how does the thermocline actually rise? Like, how does, how does it all become cool afterwards? From here to here? Yeah. So you have the winds weakening, right? So you have to think about the, the, so we have trade winds, constantly easterly trade winds. 
they push the warm water all the way to the west and to the warm pool. That's why we have the warm pool, because of the trade winds. Right? And you weaken the trade winds. That means less of this warm water is pushed this way. Less warm water means, in terms of anomalies, this means a cool anomaly. There's less, so this warm water flushes back, basically. Right? And the more this stays on, the longer you have this, the more of this cold water will pile up. And eventually, by Kelvin waves, and, and this will propagate to the east. Right? So it's a gravity balance then, right? And then this spreads out through the hole. And then, this inf so since now the thermal depth is much shallower, this cold upwelling in the eastern Pacific cools the surface more. You have more cooling then. And then that leads to the reversal. And then the same thing continues with the other way around. That make sense? Yeah. Well, it depends on how strongly you're oscillating. Right? I mean, if you have a real oscillator that is not damped and, and perfectly oscillating, you would have a bimodal distribution. But if you have something which is just weakly oscillating and mostly damped, like Enzo, it looks perfectly normal. At least it's not asymmetric. Right? I mean, there's no asymmetry between left and right extremes. It's more or less a perfectly normal distribution. So if you use the observed parameters for this recharge oscillator equation, so for these equations here, and you put um, random white noise in these terms, you get a distribution of temperature which is almost perfectly normal. In terms of precipitation extremes and drought in Australia, does the tropical Indian Ocean or tropical Pacific Ocean have more of an influence? Um, I, I wouldn't know exactly. I mean, the Indian Ocean has an influence and the Pacific has an influence. I mean, on a larger, on longer scale, the Pacific has a more predictable signal. So there's a much bigger and predictable signal in the Pacific, whereas the Indian Ocean is basically chaotic. Or, I mean, the, the one thing that is predictable in the Indian Ocean is its relationship to Enzo. Or the other part of, of the Indian Ocean is unpredictable. There might be structures that are relevant. There's, there's um, meridional dipoles along, to the west of Australia. There's basin wide warming. And there's equatorial um, structures that are relevant. So there's, there's a number of structures in the Indian Ocean that does influence our rainfall. But if you think about predictable part, it's probably more comes from the Indian Ocean. Yeah, sorry, it comes from El Niño. But there's an interaction between these two. I think it's, it's quite a debate right now how much the Indian Ocean is important and how much the Pacific is important. Given the biases that we have in models and limited observations, I think it's still an open question. But my feeling is, I mean, there's, there's studies, for example, also in Africa, what is more important, the Indian Ocean or the Pacific? For Africa, it is the Indian Ocean. But the Indian Ocean is forced by the Pacific. So it, it is the Indian Ocean temperatures which are important, but they are actually caused from the Pacific. So it's a combination of things. For Australia, this balance might be totally different. For Australia, it might be the Pacific more important for North Australia. And maybe for West and Southeast Australia, it's the Indian Ocean. So it's a, it's a balance of things. And we don't exactly know these balance, given that we have limited skills and models and limited observations. But I think, from, from my guess, if I would have to make a guess, I think they are both important. But the predictable part comes from Enzo. Yeah. Um, I'm 